This is the coolest river table that's ever been created in the history of river tables. It's a live river table. It has a water core in it. The only question is, is it real? It's gotta be fake, right? Okay, yeah. Donkey sent me a fake image. Who the hell is Screaming Donkey? Hello everybody, this is Dan with Screaming Donkey Woodwork and I can assure you this is real. And I'm gonna give it away along with some Wise Bond Deep Pour Epoxy and some other goodies. Wow. So if you wanna see how I made this, like stupid dad jokes, or just want some free stuff, stay tuned because we're about to get weird with wood. Yay. <laughs> Before we begin, a quick thanks to Wise Bond Epoxy. Wise Without Bond. their support, there would be no video today. They aren't an official sponsor, but they are giving away enough epoxy to make a swimming pool for Barbie. Come, Come on, Barbie, Barbie let's, let's go, go party. party. If you want to learn more about that, just hang out with us today. So buckle in and get ready for a chance to win a table that can make you the envy of Instagram. It's time to dive into our liquid core table pun intended. So last year, both of my boys got really into D&D, &D, and we wanted to get them some Christmas presents that reflected that. And what we kept coming back to was some dice, and it found something spectacular called a liquid core die. It was at that exact moment that I decided that I was going to make a liquid core table. And I figured, if I'm going to make it, let's make this really hard with some brittle wood that's really hard to work with. That is how we ended up with this beautiful olive wood burl. What I'm really trying to say is that I did not think this all the way through before I started. I had no clue that this adventure would include 16 hours of debarking. This bark might as well have been super glued on by the Keebler elves. Thankfully for you, you don't have to listen to me curse these demonic elves. Through the magic of editing, dork, dork we can cruise right through this at 100 times speed. This is definitely not going to be a step-by-step -step guide for you to build your own liquid core table. It's more of a proof of concept to show that it can be done on a larger scale. Before you tune out, that's not to say it can't be used as a guide. I'm really just giving myself an out here because of the obvious shortcomings of this table. Anytime I try a completely new technique, there's probably a really good chance that I'm going to screw something major up. So I'll run a smaller scale test first and decide to give that away before I even start. Normally that giveaway ends up being something small like an end table, but in this case, whoa, we gotta go big. Coffee table big. And I promise you will see why shortly. I guess we gotta talk a little bit about what's going on in the video here. At this point, my associate woodworker, Becca, or Barracuda as you may know her, was asking to get some more access to the bark, Woof. so we decided to go ahead and start making some of our cuts. It's in these tedious activities that my mind starts to drift. Here I was thinking, you know, I could probably be a woodworker by day and a ninja by night. I am super skillful with a blade that's mounted to a track. But then I think about the promise I made to my wife to not go to jail again after the hoagie incident. That blade barely touched that man's lip. How else am I going to save the world from unnecessary sandwich squeeze out? To finish up these cuts, I was going to have to roughly assemble everything first to make it look sort of like a table. This is always one of those things that takes way more time than I estimate for in the beginning. I often pull out my wishful thinking clock when making this estimate. Now you may feel that arranging the olive wood burls into a table makes you feel like a DJ at a woodworker rave. You know, you're over here mixing, matching, even doing a little scratching. But in the end, it's like Mother Nature handed you a bag of puzzle pieces and said, good luck, buddy. And you think to yourself, this could be an abstract masterpiece or yet another ode to my questionable woodworking skills. But in any case, it's going to be a burl of laughs. Get it? Burl? Boo this man. Boo! After a 45 minute break to arrange and saw, it's back to cleaning. This cleaning process sucked with a capital S. Stripping the bark off of olive wood burls is a lot like being a professional snake milker. Both jobs require a delicate touch, a steady hand, and the occasional moment where you question your life choices. It's all about skillfully extracting something without touching the pointy ends. Either way, you'll need some steady hands, and there's probably something not quite right about you to begin with. It may look like we're done here, but really we're only about halfway through. When things get this tedious, it's time to step away and try some new tactics. It may be time to pull out the Wire Wheel of, of Destiny. Destiny. Quick true story, I won this wire wheel in a fierce battle against a traveling lumberjack. Lumberjack power. Legend has it that this wire wheel was passed down through generations of wood warriors. I earnestly won the right to wield it with my strategic scissors move. Poor lumberjack couldn't help himself, he picked the only wood-related product paper. Dad, or we couldn't find the good wire wheel and sent Beck at a Home Depot to get something. I don't remember which one. All I know is this wire wheel was terrible compared to the wire wheel that my wife won when she won Miss Pennsylvania. 
Unless you like little wires shooting out all over the place and stabbing you in the arms. Watch the progression in the video from going to very big to like nothing left. Because all that metal can be found in my arms. After the two of us worked on it for about eight hours, we figured it was about as good as it was going to get. So we assembled it to make sure that we had all the pieces and then deassembled it to clean off the polyethylene below. Because now it's time to make the mold. Mold. Speaking of molds, I get a ton of flack about the way that I build my mold, so I'm going to just go ahead and say this. Don't do it the way that I do it. There are a whole bunch of creators out there who make these molds all the time, so follow what they do, don't follow what I do. As a matter of fact, when someone asks me how to build a mold, I say, if you're building one, follow what Cam does at Blacktail Studios. But it does make a whole lot of sense if you're making more than three molds over the course of a year. So if that's you, you should pay attention here. Buy yourself some natural polyethylene or some UHMWPE, which is short for Ultra High Molecular Weight Polyethylene. Hot glue the strips over the areas that the wood doesn't cover. This is only only for structure purposes, so you don't have to prevent any leaks during this glue up. Then silicone around the bottom edges of the polyethylene and the wood, and then up the edges of the polyethylene and the wood. Let the silicone cure for a day, and then pour in a thin layer of tabletop epoxy. I didn't do that with this pour because of the last thing. Have some flex paste on hand. And my molds just about never leak. That doesn't mean I never get epoxy on the floor. It just means I watch the mold for an hour afterward, and if something does start to leak out, I plug it up with the flex paste. So occasionally there's a couple of tablespoons. And that's it. You're done. There's no measuring. There's no cutting. There's no wrapping copious amounts of tuck tape around MDF. Doing the process like this saves me over an hour for each mold. Now, if your ritual is already set into place and you're the type of person, if it ain't broke, you don't fix it, I totally respect that. I have my own time-wasting rituals I do myself, and I don't begrudge anyone their own time-wasting rituals. Let's talk a little bit about your selection of glue gun, because they are definitely the superheroes of my mold-making process. They can temporarily lock almost anything in a position, but I'm on the hunt for the ultimate glue gun. One that not only attaches polyethylene to polyethylene, but one that mends hearts. So next time I forget a birthday or leave a kid on the roof of the car, all I'd have to do is go to the garage and get my trusty glue gun. Love! Alright, it is finally that magical moment where we mix up our Wisebond deep pour epoxy. So I highly recommend that you use a bucket with the little measurement lines on it. In this case I don't have to measure because I'm making up exactly a gallon and a half. So lucky me I can throw caution to the wind and just dump both bottles into the bucket. Glug, 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 glug. I don't really time how long I mix anymore. I just mix until the lines of refraction are gone. Those represent the difference between the resin and the hardener that's in there. And if they're gone, you're good. I cannot stress enough, though, you need to scrape the sides and not scrape the sides when you're pouring. <laughs> Remember when we talked about unnecessary rituals? Well, this is mine. I de-gas just about anything clear. I got a little too much foam in my vacuum chamber, so I had to let a little bit of air back in. <laughs> Once you get it nice to the top, it's just a waiting game, and this can take anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour and a half. And it really just depends on how cold your epoxy is. I don't wait for the bubbles to be completely gone because just by pouring it, you're going to introduce some more bubbles. So I just look and see when the top is about 60% clear. I call it good enough. My bubbles. Yes, that is as cool to do as it looks. So I pour the epoxy down this paint stick, or I can even pour it down the side of the wood. The object here is to keep as many bubbles out as possible, the same as you would do if you had like a beer and were pouring it down the side of a glass. Pouring clear on white is something I like to refer to as a snorgasm. Boring. It's totally boring. It just looks like water going down the middle of your river. It's not as dramatic as when you have scuffed up epoxy and it goes over it, or like when a color goes in. For 150 smackers, I feel so let down by this pour. I guess we could celebrate that we have the first of nine pours done. Yay! That's right, I poured epoxy nine separate times, and every time I did the deep pour, that took about a week to cure. Which is the exact reason why this table took me forever to make. Boo! So now is probably a good time to talk about the process. Just like our liquid cord dye, this table has six sides. And unfortunately, I don't have a mold, nor do I think they make one, that will tumble on all three axes and evenly coat the inside of a mold. So I'm stuck pouring one side at a time. 
After that, the idea in my head was to fill it with a mixture of water and glycerin and mica and make it look like flowing lava. That would have been so cool, right? A flowing lava table? I mean, who wouldn't like that? But as you can probably tell from the thumbnails and the intro to this video, that is not exactly how it turned out. Mistakes were made, and my excuses definitely are abundant. The sun was in I'm my eyes. Old. For instance, I thought about this table for months, and this is the exact moment I realized how stupid I was for picking this olive wood burl. So you see all those beautiful nooks and crannies? Well, those nooks and crannies are holes, and those holes can go all the way to the outside of the table. So that means I have to completely encapsulate this wood. Let the payment for stupidity begin. After about seven days of curing, it's time to demold. Tell me what your favorite sound is in the comments, because here's mine. So here I trimmed everything up with the Milwaukee track saw just to make sure that the sides were all even when I did the side pours. I'm really just trying to take off as little wood as possible here. You can see all the crusty silicone goodness that I'm trying to get off. That was really neat. That was almost like cutting paper off the end there. Since it's a giveaway table, it really doesn't have specified dimensions, so I wasn't super worried, but I wanted to keep it as wide as possible. Since it was going to be up on its side, I figured I was going to bump into it sooner or later, so I was going to build a little bit of a support structure around it. It was actually very stable up on the side, but my ability to bump into things is almost a superpower. So here it's the same process as before. We're just gluing that UHMWPE up onto the side of our slab, and we're going to just use the caulk around the outside of the slab. All right, so we've said caulk a few times without making a caulk joke. And my suggestion would be not to make caulk jokes. They've all been done before. If you want the big laugh, you got to go for shock value. So next time at the top of your lungs, just yell out, check out the size of that caulk. And give yourself some bonus points if you can hear your spouse's eyes rolling. Another satisfying moment. I did not film the pour on this one. There really wasn't much to see, but I did film it on one of the other ones. So at least you'll get to see one side that gets poured. Here we can see a little bit of the grain starting to pop through where I would poured the epoxy. This made me think I probably should have poured the top first, but uh, if I would have done that, I'm sure I would have screwed it up and then I would have had a messed up top that I would have had to fix. If I was in the same situation today, I'd make the exact same decision, but at least I know next time I can decide to go ahead and do the top first. And now it's just some rinse and repeat. Flip it over and do the other side the exact same way. You can see now that it's out of the mold that I poured about an inch on the side there. It's probably closer to an inch and a quarter. This little frame that I made has a little screw that holds it up that keeps it just barely suspended off that polyethylene on the bottom. 
about a half a millimeter up. And yes, I live in the U.S., but I worked for a German company for about six years, which means I now think in metric. So here you can see I stole my wife's favorite jello shooter, and what we're trying to do is match the other side and fill it up with about an inch of epoxy. It's important to note that although I didn't show it, I did scuff up all of the edges where I was pouring the new epoxy. Epoxy won't adhere to already a cured epoxy, so you have to scuff it up to give it somewhere to grab onto. Using the paintbrush again, we we're trying to just fill in all of the little nooks and crannies so there's no holes to the outside of the table. This actually didn't take all that long to do, but it did end up costing me five paintbrushes. So this is a perfect illustration of why I'm not going to do olive wood again if I do this, um, because it's going right through. So that's a hole directly into the table. It just kept absorbing it. I didn't get good film on the technique of high clogged them, but in the end it ended up being a little bit of CA glue in there to close the hole a little bit and then using tabletop epoxy to completely seal it in. Shoulder, Shoulder cam. cam. Yay! Yay. I love the sound of demolding more than a cat loves knocking stuff off a shelf. It's that satisfying pop that says, congratulations, you've birthed an epoxy abomination. If only everything in life could be as satisfying as popping that mold. You know, like finally getting that last piece of popcorn out of your teeth or hitting skip on an online ad. I would need far less bubble baths watching Golden Girls reruns. There's no gap or anything that I'm trying to fill here. I'm just adding a little bit of hot glue to keep it from sliding around. There's a whole lot of leverage on this table if it pulls, and I just wanted to give it a little bit of extra support since it's standing up on its end. Apologies here, folks. If this feels like deja vu, it is. We had to do it six times. So this is the last time we're going to show it, and we're going to skip the demolding on this one so we can move on to the more fun parts. The biggest reason I included this one was because the pour was really neat seeing it from the backside like this. So after we did the last side, there's only one side left to pour, and the only way to pour it is to drill some holes to get some access to it. I guess I could have flipped it upside down real fast like an omelet or something, but that seems like something you would probably want some practice at before you did it. And I don't know where you would get practice for flipping over an epoxy table from. Speaking of, I don't even think I could flip an omelet. I used the Forstner bits to drill the holes in the epoxy, and it made one heck of a mess, but... At the end, I had these little pom-poms that I could cheerlead with. After we cleaned it all up, we turned on Becca's shoulder cam, and she did the caulking. It's the same process as before, except for now we don't need the UHMWPE strips. Doing the sixth and final deep pour was really relieving, because at this point, I'd had it in my shop for about seven weeks. I probably could have started charging it rent. It's really easy to underestimate the monetary value of your shop space. Anything taking up space represents another project that can't be worked on. And in all that time, I didn't think once to stop by the auto parts store and buy myself a funnel. 
So we did this the long and tedious way with the Jello Shot Shooter again. And long and tedious in this case was about five minutes. And even with that, when I got to the point where I figured I could just pour it in, I just grabbed the bucket and poured the rest of it in and cleaned up the little bit of mess that it made. I didn't have to measure this because I knew the other side was exactly a gallon and a half. So I figured I was just going to be pouring in exactly a gallon and a half. On the other side, I measured it, and as soon as it got to a half inch, I stopped. With all six sides poured, it was time to take it over to the CNC machine and flatten it. At this point, I was getting pretty excited because I knew it was only right around the corner that we would be putting the liquid in it. On the side, I had been running a bunch of little tests trying to make sure that everything worked. I thought I had it all figured out, so I was ready to rock and roll. The one thing that I was really concerned with was the possibility that I would have to do a flood coat on this. I really didn't want to do it, but there were so many holes between the top of the table and the inside that I didn't think there was much of a way around it, but we made all the effort that we could to avoid doing the flood coat. Here we are just trimming it up a little bit to do the finish. This will be the finished dimensions. Again, I didn't have to measure anything. I just had to make sure that everything was parallel and square. Can't forget about square, parallel and square. Here we're just trimming it down a bit. I used the clamps this time because much like a moil, I'm just trying to take off the very tip. And like a moil, if I screw up, the wood is scarred for life. If you're wondering why I'm making this cut on the side of my CNC machine, it's because I am literally out of table space at this time. My whole shop was completely filled up. I say whole shop like I have this huge area. No, I have a two-car garage and this CNC machine takes up about a third of it. So everything in here is playing double duty at some time or another. I think doing this, some people think I have a lack of respect for my CNC machine, but I love my CNC machine. Sometimes when I'm flattening a piece on the CNC, I secretly whisper motivational quotes to it. You know, because nothing boosts the table's confidence like hearing, you're going to be the smoothest, flattest masterpiece in the whole workshop. Yes, you are. That's not weird, right? A little CNC therapy's cool, right? I feel like plenty of people have figured this out before and have explained this before, but I'm just going to say it. Um, always cut one long side first, then parallel up to that long side with the other side, and then do your short ends afterward. And nobody had to tell me to do this. It was just something that became self-evident after the first or second table that I made. But I have heard plenty of people say it, trying to save new table makers from making the same mistake. I think everybody makes it once, and then by the time you get to the fourth angle, it, it compounds on top of each other and you have this problem. Uh, if you do it this way, you're not going to have a compounding problem. If you're off by a degree, you'll be off by one degree on the whole table. Just one. So with everything all flat and parallel, it's time to move on to sanding and get all those CNC marks out of the table. Before we did that, we did mix up some tabletop epoxy and pour it into any of the pits that we had on the top of the table to try to close up all the holes. Spoiler alert, it didn't work. Let's just take a moment to admire Becca's sanding skills. Here's Becca sanding out all those CNC lines like she's erasing bad Tinder dates from her memory. Ah, the satisfaction of a job well done. Just to clarify, anything that I say is pretty much total BS unless I'm talking about the woodwork itself. Becca doesn't even own a phone, let alone have Tinder. I'm pretty sure she's Amish or Mennonite or something, but I've never bothered asking her. She's moved on to filling pits with CA glue, so all we do here is put in a little CA glue, put in a little harder, and spray it. The problem is, is some of these were still going down into the table. A lot of the times when you're filling in with CA glue, about a third of what you fill in has to be refilled in because it pops out or sinks down deeper or something. So I came in later that night to follow up behind her. She's doing the preliminary and I'm doing the follow up one. And come to find out that they weren't just sinking in a little bit. They were going into the middle of the table. So the top surface would dry, but then there would be nothing underneath it. So it was really at this point where I decided, hey... I'm going to go ahead and have to flood coat this table. So all that means is we're going to mix up some tabletop epoxy, which is a thicker epoxy, and pour it over the entire surface of the top of the table. So all of this work that Becca did is completely useless now. And it's not just a little bit of work, it's a ton of work. This was three, four hours of work for both of us. So it ended up being a total of like six man hours that we just could have totally skipped had we just decided to flood coat it in the first place. I really just thought it was worth it trying to get a wood surface next to the epoxy. It's something I do normally because it's really hard to do, but I always think that it comes out being the coolest. If you're going to have a wood top, I want to feel wood. I don't want to feel plastic. 
but every once in a while, the flood coat is the right solution. When you have softer woods or if you have something that needs to be protected in a certain way, that's the way to go. And in this case, it definitely was the way to go. But before we did that, I wanted to see how our lava would look. So I mixed up a batch of dye and we put it all in the table and we were going to see how it spun. I knew if I sprayed the table down with a little bit of alcohol, it would mimic the look that I would get when I did the flood coat. So I just really wanted to make sure that this orange worked. I had a weird feeling about it. I went ahead and mixed it up, made some adjustments as we went to try to get some more of the pearl pigment in there. Um, so you could see the mixture a little bit better. You may be thinking, by this time, surely you went out and bought a funnel. But no, no, I did not. So we're back again to filling it with a syringe. So here I could tell already that it wasn't going to mix the way that I wanted to. So I added basically a ton of pearl into the table to see if we could see some more movement within the epoxy itself. And it made a little bit of a difference, but you'll see, it wasn't enough. Another issue that we noticed right about now was I bought corks that were made of cork for the table, and they just didn't work all that great. So our motor's on and spinning. Do you see it? That's it. That is the extent of the movement. The swirl in this epoxy was harder to see than a chameleon in a rainbow convention. I had to squint so hard I think it pulled the muscle I used to find hidden patterns. If anyone needs me, I'll be over here cross-eyed searching for enlightenment riddles. So I'm not going to lie, at this point I felt pretty dejected, a little disgusted with myself even. I'd spent all this time and money trying to make it work and here I'm adding another spinning plate to it and I'll show you those up close in a minute. Um, just to see if a second vortex makes it move a little bit more, but it's moving right now, the other one, and you could barely tell that it's moving. You know, the one thing I didn't test was what happened when, you know, it was a really thin amount of water, and that's what I was worried about, that it was just thin water, and there was nothing I was going to be able to do about it, and this was as good as it was going to get. I did start doing some testing after this to see, like, what actually made the most visible impact in motion and it ended up being pearl mixed with a little bit of orange mixed with a little bit of purple some other colors did okay too so blue and white green and white did okay uh, red and black did okay ultimately the best chance i had for it to go was a purple orange and white mix but walking out of that garage that night, I felt like total crap. I felt like I'd spent all this time to produce a failure. I even decided to change out the magnet here and put in a larger magnet and a smaller magnet. I tried a bunch of different things, and I was not getting the results I wanted, and this cork was terrible, and the table was leaking all over the place. But I figured I had it all set up. I might as well test the lights while I'm here, and hopefully a different color, it will look a whole lot better on a later day. But since I have everything going here, I'm going to go ahead and hook the lights up and test the lights and see if those work. So I just temporarily taped them to the bottom of the table, making sure that they were shining through. Then we hit the lights. All right, so the lights work okay. So one thing goes right. So the next day I grab my boy, we rinse the table out as best that we can, leaving a little bit of orange in there so it'll mix with the purple. And we dumped it all out. I'm wondering if next year near my propane tank I'm going to have some orange grass though. We filled it up with water about six times and dumped it out. And this is I think the second time that we're dumping it out. So we did it until the water would come out of it was clear. But you could definitely see some orange residue left behind. And this was before I knew the colors that I wanted to put into it. So I didn't realize the orange is the color I wanted. And I just thought I could just re-pour the dye. So if I put the purple in there and the orange mixed with it and I didn't like it, I could just put purple in again. So that was kind of my plan. The mica pigments are relatively cheap and it would only cost me water and some mica pigment to try again. So I ordered some rubber stoppers off of Amazon and we decided to go ahead and flood coat it while we had a couple of days until the next weekend. Remembering back, I don't believe that I was all that optimistic at this point. I was pretty kind of, uh, I hope this is okay. I, I kind of thought we were on a bust path a little bit. And you can't do what I do without throwing some stuff away. Typically, I don't throw it away. I just give it to someone. I'm like, hey, I made this terrible thing. Does somebody want it? And somebody will always take it. So for the flood coat, we mixed up some Wise Bond tabletop epoxy. And I do about two ounces per square foot. And I do that twice. So I put it on once, uh, sand off the top to 
scuff it up again because remember epoxy doesn't stick to epoxy unless it's scuffed up pour it on again and it, more of it will sink in and then on the third coat that i do i do about three ounces per square foot so the first two coats of this are always going to look pretty bad the first one will look terrible so i don't really worry about protecting it from dust or anything like that we just pour it on pop the bubbles and then come back the next day and do it again with the last flood coat, however, you want to put it on there real thick, take your time a little bit more with it, and then you want to protect it from dust. And that's always really tricky. So normally I take these down to my basement and close off all the vents and then do it down there. Well, this is a little bit bigger than what I normally do for a flood coat. So we decided we we're going to make this tent out of plastic in the garage and seal the whole thing up. And at this point, it's starting to look really pretty, so I'm cautiously optimistic right here. See, the camera can't do it that much justice because you see the orange mica pigment powder inside the table at this point. So you're not seeing it the way that I see it, the nice straight down view. I see that all the wood looks really good. All the pits are filled in. This has a chance of being a really pretty table, even if I don't get the vortex going. And as I was doing this, Amazon dropped off my new stoppers. I used the cork stoppers in there because I, so I could pull them out and the epoxy would stick to those instead of to my good final stoppers. So you see my hand technique here that's uh, patented. Everybody else uses spreading tools, so if you use just a glove hand, you have to send me $8. One final pass with the torch just to make sure it flattens everything out, pops all the little bubbles on the surface. We're nice and clear. You can see it here. It's starting to get nice and smooth. The wood looks really good. My excitement is bubbling up more and more at this point. All right, so here is the little trick behind my vortex. It is this little mixer plate. So you put this little pill-looking magnet on it, turn it on, and it spins. And I think the better demonstration of this is in the bucket. So the mica here is all stuck to the bottom of the bucket, so this will show you how much it'll kick up. And right there, we're already looking at words like success. So this inspired the table in the first place. We just couldn't get it going to where it would look good. But here's something that looked really good. Becca made me do this shot, and it turned out fantastic. I really like how pretty this turned out. So now we had to just cover it up to make sure that we didn't get any dust in it because it'll ruin the finish. The whole idea is you do the flood coat and do the last one and you're done with it. You don't have to make any more changes. You don't have to sand it again. So if your flood coat's done right, that's what ends up happening. The thing is, is it's not always done right. It doesn't always work the way that you want it to and almost always gets dust in it. A couple of days later, we pull it out, flip it over, and sand off all the little drip marks from the bottom. And then we're going to sand over the bottom of this to lightly frost it to help with light dissipation. So you may think I want this perfectly clear, but I don't because the frosting will help a little bit when we put the lights on there to act as a little bit of a filter. You're not going to be able to see the bottom of this table anyway, but we did want to get it flat, so we did fill in any of the major pits that were in the bottom of the table, so in case you reach your hands across it, that you don't feel little holes on the bottom that scratch your fingers. All right, and this is definitely a part that highlights the shortcomings of this table. I didn't think this through all the way with legs, so I didn't figure out how I was going to attach the legs. So what we ended up doing was just gluing on some walnut. And pretty much this was the consensus of some pretty smart woodworkers. And we even considered doing double-sided tape to put the legs on there because I've actually done that before. I just didn't have that much faith in double-sided tape. There's a very specific application that I agree on using it for, and this is not it. If you are enjoying the journey of crafting this liquid core tabletop with me, you are in for a treat. We're giving you a chance to win this fun little coffee table. All you have to do is hit that subscribe button, join our fantastic community, and stay tuned for more incredible projects. And if you want a chance to win three gallons of wine bond epoxy and an hour of consulting from me, smack the like button like it owes you money and leave me a comment with the name of your favorite epoxy wise bond. Those of you that are part of my 5,762 subscribers have double the chance to win the table. A special thank you to those who subscribed early to my YouTube channel. And hey, don't forget to ring that notification bell. It's your golden ticket to be the first to 
to know about our latest creations, and of course, your shot at taking the liquid core table home. So hit that subscribe button, and let's turn this adventure into a winner. All right, so we're slowly filling this table up, and what we see is the purple looks a little flat. One key difference you may notice is I am adding glycerin to the water, so that glycerin will help the mica flow a little bit better. And it should also prevent it from getting funguses and gross stuff in it too. If it doesn't, you could, I guess, stick a chlorine tablet in it, like a really small one. But that shake up there gave me all the confidence that I needed. Right when I was shaking it up going, oh yeah, th this is definitely going to look good. I got my rubber stoppers in. I got my lights taped down to the bottom. It's filling up really nice. Anytime I move it around, the water swirls just the right way. So I did have to do a little bit of buffing on this table. Uh, and the only reason I bring this up is because I kept shooting those rubber stoppers across the room every time I hit them. I only had two of them that were exactly the right size. And uh, I lost them four times and found them four times. And this right here was the first shot that anyone got to see of the liquid core table. And it was on a live. So the first one where I screwed it up was on a live too. And this one was on a live. So I was watching this. And it was at this moment that I knew that I made something really cool. This is definitely one of those proud papa moments. I was so like amped up after this. So we were doing a live. I stayed on the live for about three hours just answering questions about the table. We had a few hundred viewers like at a constant stream coming in and checking it out. There you got to see the test with the lights on it and everything, and we fired it back up and played with it the whole rest of the night. I was just beaming, though. Like, it was like, oh, my God, I put all this work and effort into it. It works. It looks really cool, and now I want to keep it. Boo this man. Boo. But I can't because I promised to give it away. So, for sure, we have a proof of concept. Is it everything that I hoped that it would be? No. But in a way, it's more than what I hoped it would be, too. So having the idea in my head is one thing. Seeing it in the table being a reality was another. I'm just really happy with how it turned out. It was a whole lot of work. I could tell you that much. And it was a whole lot of fun to do. Now, the next thing that I want to do with this is build a probably dining room size table. It will be really 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 expensive um so if you are calling to inquire about it please just know it would be well out of my price range and most of the people that i know is price range but if you are someone who makes these types of tables and are interested in building these types of tables for someone you let me know and i will point the inquiries about this your way just because i'm, I'm already booked out a year don't break your arm there patting yourself on the back i just want to take a moment to address what i think is going to be an obvious question and why I opted not to name my liquid core table the purple rain table. And that's because I couldn't find a tiny purple velvet jacket for it. I figured if I'm going to evoke Prince vibes, I should at least be able to do it justice with the right wardrobe. So we're going with the liquid core table in part because the color could be changed and also because I don't want to be sued by the estate of Prince. If you have a better idea though, post it up in the comments. I'm always looking for better ideas. Before we go, I just want to say thank you so much. I do appreciate all the support that I got. I'm going to have a couple of closing words after this about some of the creators who've inspired me. Please take the time to listen to that. Remember, just a few years ago, I was some jerk in my basement making weird things out of wood. Now I'm a jerk in my garage making weird things out of wood. And if I could do it, anyone can do it. So next time you're bored, don't just get sick of the ordinary. Dive into the world of epoxy and wood and create something legendary. Get weird with wood. All right, the donkey sent me a design for an all new epoxy table, I think, and I'm gonna act very surprised and very supportive, but everything's already been done before, so bear with me here. All right, that appears to be some sort of AI generated image, I think. I've seen an app before, but he's setting something on the image. Okay, I don't know how he did that. Might also be made from the carpet in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas gotta be fake right okay yeah donkey sent me a fake image fake image that also glows in the dark it's fake right it's fake yeah it's gotta be fake the only question is is it real the screaming donkey woodwork says it is i think it is too and it's amazing all right dan the donkey i just looked at your table and i honestly i didn't think 
epoxy river tables really had anywhere else that they could go, but you have proven that wrong with this absolutely insane table. So, good job. I'm not gonna respond to this. It would only encourage him to keep doing whatever this is. On the other hand, I don't wanna do actual work, so how bad could it be? That's it. I'm done. I'm f done. The hell with this. If you haven't had enough punishment yet, feel free to click on some of my other videos where I didn't try as hard.